umbrella for today's um, presentations is open data. And within that, I'm going to be talking a little bit about OpenStreetMap. And um, good clickers working, right? So if we start from the point that everything happens somewhere, uh, and then next, that it's useful to know where that something is happening, and that furthermore, it would be useful to be able to get to the place where the something is happening, we can um, draw the conclusion that maps are important. Um, and maps traditionally have been about control, really. Um, maps were used to be drawn by the rich, they used to be drawn by the exceptional, the winners, uh, the people who did things differently, the people who sailed west instead of east. And they represented the views of the cartographer, um, or at least the person who commissioned the cartographer. And we've come further than that, we've come to the point now where everyone has a map in their phone, in their pocket. So it seems to make sense that the next step for that would be to actually have a map on your phone, in your pocket, that you can make, that you can edit. And that's what OpenStreetMap is about to some degree. It's about taking control back. For example, I put this up here. This is a screen grab from a data visualization that uh, we produced at ETO. Um, the story behind it is within minutes, certainly hours, of the Haiti earthquake happening in 2010, the OpenStreetMap community um, got straight onto their, um, uh, their laptops and started editing, drawing traces over aerial imagery to help the emergency rescue workers. Um, you're probably aware, but in Port-au-Prince, um, everything just fell over, so nobody knew where anything was. The OpenStreetMap community very quickly produced between them, uh, remotely, armchair mapping. Within, I think, a day, they had produced the most up-to-date, uh, well, it wasn't up-to-date, it was completely wrong, because there was nothing there, the most data-rich, accurate um, map that had ever been made of Haiti, within hours. And what that allowed um, the emergency rescuers on the ground to do was look at their own mobile phones and so on, get the global data set updated, look at it, and they could say, look, over there, there was a school, let's start digging. Over there, there's a hospital, let's get to work. Uh, Kameishi was a town that was particularly badly hit by the tsunami. And uh, I met him in the town as part of a voluntary humanitarian open street map uh, mapping team and we went along to Kameishi to map the temporary housing. Um, a lot of people were displaced following the tsunami. What you can see there is, well, that's four apartments, would you believe it? Um, the gravel was laid down on what used to be um, a baseball pitch for the local junior high school, and porter cabins were kind of brought in, and they just sat there. Now, people had already been living there 18 months when I visited. Um, I don't know quite how long they're expected to live there. Um, if we look here, you can see a two-tier um, temporary shopping. You can see the universal sign for a barber. Um, there's more of these apartment blocks, and we literally put them on the map. Prior to uh, the humanitarian um, team going along, you know, the, the, they had no address even, uh, these people. So um, hopefully we've done a little something there. And uh, there's a couple more volunteers. Um, wandering around helping to put these things on the map. Now this whole exercise was quite poignant to me because um, in the 90s I lived in Japan and um, I lived in the area that was later affected by the tsunami and for a period of a couple of years I worked in this school here and uh, that's what it looked like before the tsunami that's what it looked like afterwards and um, it was particularly nasty story, this uh, particular school became something of a symbol of the tragedy. The kids came out of the school, as would be expected after an earthquake, as part of the drill, and they should have made their way to higher ground, but the teachers did it. And 45 minutes later, they were still standing on this um, flat area. When the water came in, they lost, I think it was 88 out of 95 kids, and all but one of the teachers. Which is a pity, because they could have just walked up that bit of hill there. Now, there was a fear at the time that the earthquake had sort of destabilised a lot of the trees. Um, no one made a decision. And there's a shrine uh, at the school now. So, here's a place called Sviersk um, in Russia. 
it was one of the so-called Zakritia Brazovania, which is uh, the closed areas, and um, you had to access this checkpoint even to get in or out. It didn't exist on maps. It, it didn't exist at all. No one, no one was there. Nothing to see. Now, look at it. I mean, I lived in Russia 20 years ago. They didn't even have public banks. Now, we've got ATMs being mapped openly in a town that didn't used to exist. So things have moved on. Um, and a lot of it's about open data. This unlikely looking image is lampposts in Nottingham. <laughs> it's not a subject that normally evokes that sort of reaction, but I'm glad that that's what's happening here. What you can see, every yellow and red spot is a lamppost. When Nottingham City Council decided to release the data, they did so because they couldn't bother to look after it anymore themselves. They said, let's get it out in the open, let's let people use it. Fantastic. Some bright spark determined that in the coding for each individual lamppost, there was um, a sort of a nod to uh, a real physical address. And that's because, you know, lamppost number 56 was uh, adjacent to 14 Leafston Road. And the next lamppost was adjacent to 17 Leafston Road, or whatever. Somebody was able to kind of delve into the data and determine actual uh, post postal addresses. And that's quite useful because the Royal Mail kept the GB um, database. The and this is what uh, Microsoft Bing thought. Um, they co clearly couldn't compete with Google photographing the world, so they just gave their aerial imagery to the OpenStreetMap community. So when you try to edit uh, OpenStreetMap, you load it up, um, you load up the editing suite, and you'll see the aerial imagery then, and then the things that have already been drawn appear. And it's just sort of um, it's fairly self-explanatory, really. You click on a node, and you just draw around, and then you say, oh, tag that as a building. That's all the detail you need to add. If you have more information, like you know the address, or you know how many floors it is, or you know who, who it belongs to, you can add all that stuff. Well, that's, where it, um, that's where it starts. So where does Ito fit into all this? Um, well, Ito is very good at engaging the community uh, and decluttering um, the separate data sets. Um, this, for example, is the, um, the intensity represents the frequency of bus services in London. You can clearly see um, Oxford Street, Edgware Road, Old Kent Road down here. Um, so th that's quite a nice way of displaying the data, but there's, there's more useful things you can do with that. So, for example, speed limits. You can see the key up here. But I can tell you that the orange is 30 limits and the green is 20. Um, so uh, other things that we can do, Ito can do with the data, is we took the open casualty data set from the police and put it on a map for The Guardian. In fact, this ran uh, during Road Peace Week a couple of years ago. Um, we also have a sort of proprietary map layer as well where you can click radio buttons. To, so, for example, you can say, only show me uh, women casualties in their 30s who were knocked off bicycles by trucks. Uh, so you can really drill down into the data. How else is OSM being used? Well, um, open pieced map, um, open C map. Um, Warwickshire County Council used open street map to show their election results. Um, accessibility mapping, this chap here called Raoul, he's led um, the accessibility mapping he started in Germany, where he's from, um, but it gives uh, accessibility details, wheelchair access details for bars, restaurants, and so on. But, um, what's the quote that's associated with this picture? Anyone know? Show me the money, exactly. Is anyone commercializing OSM? Um, well, there's a couple of organizations. Um, Skobler in Germany, who've just been acquired by Telenav. Um, they've been making quite nice money out of uh, the routing options within OpenStreetMap. Telly never doing similar things over in America. Um, so there's a lot of people around trying to work out ways of commercializing it, uh, and there's a lot of people who are slightly resistant to that. But I think the two can, can, can benefit each other. Um, it's a meritocracy. It's, uh, we're in the 21st century. It's open data. People can do with it what they would like. And if you can also make money whilst making fun applications and having fun, then, then terrific. There is something of a divide between traditionalists and, I suppose, non-traditionalists. Traditionalists think the only way to map is get on your bike and take your GPS device. Anything else is cheating. 
armchair mapping, rubbish. Aerial imagery, pfft. I don't agree. I think that any way that improves the data set and makes it available is a good thing. Thank you very much for listening.